So, good evening. Uh, so, I'm Nick Johnson, lead developer for ENS, and I'm here to tell you about uh, what we've done in the last year and what our plans are for the next year. So, uh, ENS launched on the public main network uh, on May the 4th, as in May the 4th be with you. Uh, it had an eight-week soft launch period during which we gradually released names for availability in a randomised process. Uh, over that eight-week period, and my there we go. Over my, the eight-week period, uh, 180,000 names were auctioned. Uh, as you can see, after an initial sort of gold rush spike, that was a fairly uh, consistent rate over the whole period. Uh, and to buy those 180,000 names, uh, roughly 170,000 Ether was deposited into a smart contract. Uh, users who purchase names have their Ether hold, held for at least a year um, or until they release the name. Uh, as you can see from the graph here, the uh, contributions, the, the amount that was being deposited on names uh, reduced fairly sharply at the end of the uh, eight-week launch period, which is a fairly good indication that most of the contentious names were bought during that period. So uh, it's interesting to look at how much people paid on average for an ENS name, or rather how much they deposited, uh, and what proportion of names were um, contentious, had more than one bid. So if we divide names up into names that were in a short list that we have of common uh, domain names and dictionary words and those that aren't, about 35% of those that were uh, in the dictionary were contended, uh, had more than one bid, uh, compared to only about 7.2% of names that weren't in the list. Uh, and as you can see, again, uh, for the names that were in the list, uh, after a short sort of gold rush period, uh, there was a gradual decrease in contention rate, uh, while names that weren't in the list, the line on the bottom there, uh, were fairly consistent in terms of uh, how often they were competed for. Um, so spl again, splitting up by whether the name was known or not, uh, the average price paid for an ENS name in the list was about 0.05 Ether, uh, and the price for a name uh, not on the list was only 0.02. And as you can see on the right side there, when the soft launch period came to an end, uh, the, both of those bottomed out to uh, very low contention rates and, and very low medium prices, indicating that most people that wanted to compete for a name got it during the launch period. Uh, so one of the main concerns about the auction process uh, was the potential for people to lose their bids by failing to reveal during the correct period. Uh, and that was something we uh, a concern we shared in the design of the registrar. Uh, as you can see here, from an initial reasonably high uh, rate of uh, loss for deposits, that rapidly decreased, and we had an average of only 0.3%. Um, we're satisfied that the rate is, is uh, quite low, but we're not sort of resting on our laurels. We want to continue to improve uh, the auction process, make it easier for people to interact with, and less likely that they will uh, lose funds or uh, harder to, to um, make mistakes, uh, as we'll see soon. Uh, it's also interesting to look at the ownership distribution of names, because this gives us an indication of how many names were bought uh, with active use in mind, as opposed to how many were bought with the intention of uh, hoarding them. Uh, so roughly 8,500 people bought names uh, during the launch period. Uh, of those, uh, about 123 of them, 1.4% of the total registrants, own half the registered names. And in order to buy those half the registered names, uh, they paid only about 20% of the total registration fees, or about 34,000 Ether. Uh, and from the histogram here, you can see that the vast majority of accounts, over 5,000 of them, uh, own no more than five names, with a long tail distribution uh, continuing off all the way to the largest ENS name whale here at uh, 17,507 names. Uh, client adoption since the launch has been excellent. Uh, we have support in MetaMask, uh, MyEtherWallet, um, EtherScan, a variety of other clients and mobile wallets. Uh, and one of our main efforts for the ongoing uh, ENS effort will be to increase client adoption, particularly with exchanges. You might notice we only have one pioneering exchange in this list, and we really want to improve that. Uh, in August 2017, we had the first ENS workshop. Uh, this was a gathering of people interested in advancing the state of the art with ENS, building out new infrastructure. 
uh, and deciding what the permanent registrar should look like. We had 27 participants uh, and we discussed over three days a number of issues, uh, including dispute resolution, uh, design of a permanent registrar, how to secure subdomains, uh, and DNS integration. And I'll go briefly over what we have uh, determined in the workshop and how we've progressed things since then. So the first uh, topic that we discussed quite extensively was dispute resolution. Um, ENS, uh, with the interim registrar on .eth, has no built-in dispute resolution mechanism. And this was a deliberate choice because we wanted to build the simplest possible registrar to get things started and then learn from the experience in order to uh, build a better permanent registrar. The consensus decision at the workshop was that a dispute resolution should initially be built as a sort of a second layer. So we would have opt-in blacklists. Uh, they would follow their own processes, whatever they see fit for blacklisting domains. Uh, and users and wallets could then voluntarily subscribe to a blacklist that met their requirements, or none at all if they prefer. So for instance, here we have an example blacklist in the middle, the user doing the resolution on the left, and ENS on the right. The user wants to resolve, say, foo.xyz. In this case, the domain isn't in the blacklist, so the blacklist simply passes the request onto ENS, which responds as normal. If the user then wants to resolve a domain that is in the blacklist, like bad.xyz, the blacklist detects this and returns a null result, ensuring that phishing and spam domains and scammers don't get resolved. Uh, and sorry, I should add, um, the goal uh, in the long run is to build experience with operating these uh, blacklist registrars um, as a, a second layer and then evaluate further later whether they should be integrated into the base layer or whether it should continue to be a separate opt-in solution. Uh, the second major topic of discussion was uh, design of the permanent ENS registrar. And one of the un unanticipated consequences of the deposit-based model for ENS is that different participants in the market have very different costs of capital. Uh, on the left here, we have the user who is registering a domain with the intention of using it directly. And to them, the cost of putting down a deposit is effectively the whole cost of the deposit because they intend to retain the name indefinitely. They can't count on relinquishing the name and getting those funds back. Uh, on the other hand, you have the investor who is looking for some way to invest their ether and the cost to them is effectively the opportunity cost of not being able to use it for other things. And finally, you have the speculator who would be holding Ether regardless, and they see ENS names as an almost risk-free way to um, hold their Ether. Um, so our conclusion from the workshop is that we should transition to a rent-based model. And in a rent-based model, uh, every name has an annual fee, which is assessed sort of uh, continuously, um, and as a result, everyone has effectively the same cost for holding a domain. Uh, it's also important to note that the plan is that all domains would have the same ongoing rent. Uh, this wouldn't depend on how much you paid for the domain at auction, because we have no desire to penalize people merely for being popular. Uh, the next logical question is how you determine the rent. Uh, an ultimately unsatisfying option is to simply uh, have somebody set it by fiat, as it were, uh, and revise it from time to time. Um, but we think we have a more elegant approach, and this was suggested by Vlad Zamfir at the workshop. Uh, the insight is that the goal of having rent is to encourage deregistration of unpopular names or unused names that aren't wanted. And so we can monitor the deregistration rate, which is the blue line there, and set a target deregistration rate. The contract can monitor how many names are being deregistered, and then it can adjust the rent price to attempt to maintain a fixed rate. So in this example here, some external event, perhaps an increase in the price of Ether, results in a spike in the deregistration rate, and the registrar responds by decreasing the rent until it reaches a stable level again. And you can see here another event, perhaps uh, increasing popularity in uh, ENS, uh, results in a decrease in the deregistration rate, and the registrar responds by again increasing the price until it's stable. Uh, the next uh, issue that we addressed, um, and this has actually come up largely uh, subsequent to the workshop and as a result of discussions in our internal Gitter channels, um, was ways to simplify the auction mechanism. Um, 
although it's generally behaved quite well, there is some inevitable information leakage in that you have to start an auction on a name in order to bid on it, and that provides some information to people on what names you're likely to be bidding on and what names are, are up for auction in general. And this can be disguised uh, by opening sort of chaff auctions alongside the real ones, but this disguise isn't perfect. So our proposal for the permanent registrar is to switch to a rolling auction mechanism. The way this works is uh, auction periods start uh, every 48 hours in this example, and you have a 48 hour bid period during which anybody can bid on any unknown name. And that's immediately followed by a 48 hour reveal period during which anyone who bids needs to reveal the name. Simultaneous with the start of the first reveal period, a second bid period starts. Uh, and again, any unregistered name can be bid on. If somebody uh, bid on a name in phase one, and then another person bids on the name in phase two, then when the name is revealed, they simply get a full refund. The result of this is that uh, there is no information leaked as to what names are being auctioned, which means that people have to bid the legitimate value of the names they want, rather than sort of sniping and griefing the system. And this continues on an ongoing basis with uh, bid periods automatically starting. Uh, it also simplifies the system. It reduces the number of interactions you need to engage with the system by one. So the next feature I'd like to announce, um, this, as you can see, is a perfectly ordinary MyEther wallet uh, instance. This is on the um, internet, public internet. You can see it's connected to Ropston. Uh, and I, as you know, uh, MyEther wallet has had support for ENS names since day one. What it hasn't had is the support to resolve these names. Oh, blast. And that's the problem with doing an, a presentation on screen. If this was working, and I'm going to blame the internet connection, uh, what you would have seen, there we go, it's correctly resolving an ENS address for an XYZ domain. Uh, and to figure out why this, uh, how this works, uh, we need to take a bit of a diversion and talk about DNSSEC. Uh, DNSSEC establishes a chain of trust uh, from the root uh, key, which is signed by uh, ICANN uh, and down through uh, each key. So we start off knowing only the hash of the root key of DNS, and this is coded into a smart contract oracle. Uh, given, that that, given the hash of that key, uh, we can pass in the actual key, we can verify that it matches the hash, and we can add it to our set of trusted records. And given that key, we can now verify any record that is signed with that key. So in this case, it's the hash of the root key for the XYZ top level domain. And given that, then we can recognize the key and so on and so forth. So next we can recognize the key for ethlab.xyz. Given that, we can recognize, uh, sorry, the hash for the key and then the key itself. And finally, we can uh, validate a signed text record containing an Ethereum address. So this is how the overall system works. Given that chain of trust established previously, uh, users can submit proofs to uh, a DNSSEC oracle on the chain, and the proof is exactly what we saw earlier. For any records that it doesn't know about, it contains the record and it contains a signature verifying its accuracy. Once they've done that, the user can call the registrar, uh, the new DNSSEC registrar, which has a claim function. The registrar then queries the oracle and says, is there a text record for the name they're trying to claim? And it responds with any text records, and the registrar passes those text records to determine e any ENS addresses. If it finds one, uh, sorry, Ethereum addresses. If it finds one, uh, it checks it against the caller, checks that the person who is calling the uh, registrar is in fact the address specified, and if they are, then it calls ENS and sets the record in ENS. And this is now fully functional on the Ropson test network. You can register any DNS domain. Thank you. So initially for testing purposes, we're starting only with the .xyz top level domain, and we're grateful to them for cooperating with us on this. Um, but in principle, this can be expanded to any DNSSEC domain that supports uh, sec p uh, sorry, RSA and SHA-256. So while we'll initially start off with this and migrate to mainnet initially with it, we want to expand it out to support all of those domains. So that means not just XYZ, but also all of these domains. 
and uh, all of these domains, and 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 it ends at some point. There we go, and all of those. In total, about three quarters of internet TLDs currently support the algorithms we need, uh, and if we integrate SHA-1 support, that rises to about 96%. So the next thing I'd like to show off is something that aims to improve the usability of ENS for end users. One of the major barriers to adoption has been that for somebody to simply name their wallet requires a multi-step process involving an auction process. And it's always been our vision that most users uh, don't buy top-level domains in the same way that most users sign up to Gmail rather than buying their own vanity domain. And ENS now is our attempt at making this easier for users, and it makes the process of registering a subdomain extremely easy. Uh, that didn't go quite how it's supposed to. Um, so in this case, I'll search for Vitalik, for instance, if I can spell his name, which apparently I can't, uh, and we see that we have different top level, uh, second level domains, gimme thee and want some. Uh, want some's already taken, so I'll click on gimme thee, pops up a MetaMask confirmation window, grossly enlarged here thanks to my full screen. Uh, as you can see, it's gonna cost us about $2.84, 0.01 ether, takes a bit of gas, uh, click submit. As soon as that's mined, which is instantaneous, in this case, the name is registered and it's pointed at your wallet. That's one step and about 30 seconds to register an ENS domain for any wallet. So uh, before I go, one more thing, and I'm gonna pause to see if anybody gets the pun. Maybe not. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to be forming the ENS Foundation, an independent legal organization whose goal will be, thank you, will be to forward the goals of ENS uh, to help promote its adoption and to help standardize things. Uh, it will be a not-for-profit um, organization in, ten, uh, in the pattern of the W3C or IANA, um, in t uh, sorry, the IETF, uh, intended to help promote ENS adoption, and no, there will not be any form of ICO. <laughs> and uh, finally, I'd like to close by thanking everyone who made this possible, particularly all the attendees at the ENS workshop. Uh, Alex van der Sand, who couldn't be here because he's having a baby. Uh, Leonard Tan, uh, our ENS volunteer who recently presented some of this material to ICANN, including the ICANN Technical Working Group and the board. Um, and I honestly do not know how to pronounce his name, Oli, Oli uh, who inspired the rolling auction system by coming into the uh, Gitter channel and complaining about uh, how bad the existing system was. Um, Easy DNS for their uh, support with DNSSEC integration, uh, and Mano from ENS Listing for feedback on ENS Now. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>